Welcome to this episode of Boost It TV where we've got a great interview lined up for you with pilot and entrepreneur Dick Nurnberg. He's got an incredible story because he's actually 87 years old and he flies his own jet and he's going to tell the story of the different airplanes he's had throughout his career. He started off as a lawyer then became a real estate entrepreneur and a pilot at the same time and how he's used the airplane to build his business. So let's get straight into the interview today with Dick Nurnberg. Off we go. After about seven years of being uh, practicing law, I decided to at least try the real estate business. And in that connection, I bought a small home near where I live in Pittsburgh. I converted it to three rental units, and that was in 1972. And from that point on, very soon thereafter, I quit my law practice and devoted myself full time to basically at that time renovating single family homes into multifamily three and four unit homes. And then in 19, I believe 72, 73, I bought my first large apartment building of 150 units. And subsequent to that, we built this business up over the last 50 years. Wow. And you did that locally from in Pittsburgh? Well, initially. we did it. It was done locally. Uh, actually, even in, I think it was 1973 or four, I bought a property out of state in West Virginia. So that okay. was my first foray into another state. And okay. then much later on, we began to buy properties in other states and build them in other states. So that at this point, I believe we're in 16 states. So what makes you select to go to a certain area to build? How, how do you get well, to that area? Well, that's a good question. Uh, and this ties in with the flying. Yeah. The basic uh, uh, criteria is that I want to be able to fly there within two, two hours to no more at the very most two and a half hours. So that yeah. is the basis for how far I will go. I don't want okay. the trip to take more than that amount of time. Is there a reason for that? Two, two well, there hours? is because I find that particularly I'm 87 years old. I think okay. I'm one of the oldest jet pilots uh, still flying in the United States. But at 87, I get tired out. I go fly to a property, then I have to go see it, walk the property, talk to the people there, then go back in the plane. It's a lot for me. So that the two, two and a half hours is basically five to six hours back and forth. I never stay overnight. It's okay. uh, uh, a practice that I don't uh, adhere to in the sense that I want to be home every night. So okay. that's interesting. Okay. So how soon did you start flying and what brought you into thinking? I, I, that I started, could be a business tool? Well, interestingly enough, a friend of mine took me up in his airplane when I was probably in my late thirties and I, just loved the idea of defying gravity, so yeah. that in 1982 or so, I bought my first plane, a Mooney, a turbocharged yeah. Mooney. I've flown the Mooney, yep. Good airplane. Yes. Nice airplane, very nice airplane. A 231. Yeah. Mooney 231. Yeah, I flew the 231. I flew the yeah. 231, yeah. So, um, yeah. So, so you bought the first airplane. and Did you buy it because you wanted just to fly as a hobby? Or did you buy it because you thought this can be a tool? I mean, what, what was no, the, the I main driving factor? I bought it as a hobby. I really liked flying. And then yeah. soon afterwards, my wife and I bought a home in Florida. And I used it to go back and forth to Florida for a little while. But it required a stop. And yeah. following that purchase of that home, I then bought a Seneca, a Seneca 3. Okay, and, yeah. And that was, if I recall, I think we could almost get to the house or pretty close to it without having okay. to stop. And, yeah. on, and then I bought any number of other airplanes. If you want me to recite what I've yeah, done. yeah, we'd, yeah, yeah, we'd like, I'd like, we'd like, you know, those watching oh. would like to hear your progression. What took you from one plane to the next? Okay, and, and when did you start using it as a business tool as well? Well, I bought the uh, um, Mooney. Simply for pleasure flying the Seneca as well. Okay. But then I bought a um, Cheyenne 1, if I recall. 
Yeah. We started yeah. to use that for flying to some of these properties that uh, were a little further out from Pittsburgh. Uh, following the Seneca one, the uh, Cheyenne one, mm -hmm. I'm trying to recall all the planes I've had. I bought a 441, a Conquest. Okay, yeah. Yeah. And that I started using because I opened up a bank in Florida, okay. as well as the state of Washington. Okay. So I began to use that plane to get back and forth to those destinations. That was followed by another 441, followed by a King Air 250. So, uh, so uh, Dick, when you, when you bought these airplanes, did you keep the previous one or did you sell the previous one and then? I would sell, sell the previous one. Okay. And so I never had more than one plane at one time. Following the King Air purchase, I then bought a um, a, a Citation One, a yep. Citation Two Plus, a Citation Three, and then finally a Five Sixty. That's what I have now. Those planes, particularly the Five Sixty, which I own now, is used basically for business because of all the properties in the sixteen states. I uh -huh. use this airplane to get me from one property to the next, from Pittsburgh. So, so you obviously, having a, a Citation XLS, you require a second pilot. So yeah. what was it like for you to transition from always, were you, I, I imagine when you're flying a Citation 1, were you flying single pilot or did you have another pilot with you? I was flying single pilot. When I moved okay. to Citation 2 Plus, I had a safety pilot with me. Same for the Citation 3. And for yep. this airplane, of course, there have to be two pilots. Yep. And I hired a full-time ex-military uh, colonel who is now my PIC. I, the insurance company will not insure anybody over 70 as PIC. So okay. I function as an SIC. Okay. Okay, good. Interesting. So tell me about, you know, uh, more about the, the, the using the airplane as a business tool. How is this it's, giving you an advantage compared to someone that was flying just commercial? This business could, <clears throat> could not have been built without this airplane. And that's okay. because in a city like Pittsburgh, <clears throat> our air service is very poor. Very, okay. very, there are very few destinations you can make without stopping somewhere. For example, uh -huh. we have a property, two properties in Knoxville, Tennessee. To okay. go to Knoxville, Tennessee takes me an hour and 10 minutes. If you were to go commercially, it's a full day because of the way the hub, hub and spoke system works. So you would be spending two, two or three days that I can accomplish in two hours. Wow. I can get there an hour and 15 minutes, yeah. go to the property, which takes me an hour, and be back home in three and a half hours from start to finish. I do it commercially, two to three days. And that applies to most of the destinations that we fly to, particularly in New England. We're doing a lot of building in New England now. To get to New England and back is two to three days. For me, it's an hour. It's only, for example, to New York, it's... 50 minutes, five zero minutes. Yeah. Imagine trying to get there commercially. Can't yeah. do it. There's no way. Yeah. Yeah. For our, there's no way to run this business without this airplane. We also take our people back and forth to these jobs so okay. that if they don't have the benefit of the plane, we're wasting two or three days just getting there. Yeah. So yeah, it's, it's in a, to me, it's probably the uh, best business tool that anybody could uh, possibly acquire if you have multiple destinations to go to or you're in a town like Pittsburgh where the air service is so poor. Mm -hmm. Okay, very interesting. So tell, tell us about what type of real estate are you investing in today and, and how do you see the market going? Uh, right now, for the last any number of years, I've invested only in residential real estate. At one okay. point, we owned uh, quite a bit of commercial shopping center space, perhaps a million and a half square feet. 
we also own uh, probably three or 400,000 feet of office space. At this point, all the commercial was sold years ago. The office space has been diminished to one building. And at this point, we only build, buy, and develop apartment buildings in these 16 states. In those 16 states, we right now have approximately 9,200 apartment units with almost uh, 3,000 that are either uh, being built or will be started in the next six months or so. So now you're no longer renovating, you're buying land and building a whole apartment block. That, that's true. That's because the market has changed. It's very difficult to buy anything that makes sense. So we have to do it ourselves. So apart from the two to two and a half hour distance from Pittsburgh, what other criteria do you use in selecting an area to build some, some residential real estate? Good question. Basically, we're looking at where the rents are best, where the competition is the least. For example, you find nationally, all the developers are going to Arizona. They're all going out to the so-called sunshine states. But that market is being overwhelmed at this point, being saturated. Whereas in New England, there isn't much interest on the part of these national developers to go there. And we're finding spots where nobody's built for the last 30, 40, 50 years. The demand is very strong. The rents are high. So yeah. that is what guides us. Okay. Very interesting. Um, now, tell us about, you know, obviously you've had different aeroplanes. What has been the reasons for choosing certain planes? Is it because you just like the plane or, I mean, what, what kind of criteria did you use to, to for example, go well, from a conquest to a King Air, from the King Air to the Citation? Well, once again, um, at the time I bought the King Air, uh, the, uh, the 525 line had not yet been introduced. And it just okay. seemed to me that the older citations were not as reliable and might have required two pilots. When the 525 line came out, it was just a great sing single pilot airplane. And that's what induced me to switch over. The, as a, and the, the, the 250, for example, would be a three hour and 20 minute flight to Palm Beach with an out, a ceiling of 35,000 feet. The uh, Citation 1 would get there in, in probably two hours and 30 minutes, say 45 minutes, altitude of 41,000 feet. And you yeah. being a pilot, you understand the difference between 35 and 41, particularly going down to Florida, makes a, a, a tremendous difference because you're going to be able almost always to top the weather. Yeah, yeah. That's, 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 really cool. that's what the citation offers, which a turboprop won't do. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. So what made you choose the XLS over its competitors? Well, I don't know that the, uh, I'm thinking the competitors, the S. XOS mid-sized jets, it's certainly the least expensive uh, of the mid-sized jets. And yeah. uh, I felt that the training going to the uh, Collins was a lot easier than it would be the switching to the Garmin, which all the others have. The only plane that has the, uh, uh, has the um, pro line now is the um, Praetor 500 which yeah. I looked at and I, you know, I, I thought about buying a Praetor 500, but the problem is that there's a two year wait. Okay. So did you buy your XLS plus new or did you buy it pre-owned? I've only bought these airplanes are all new. I don't buy used airplanes. Okay. And how long have you had your XLS now? Five years. Oh, wow. That's good. It's an XLS plus. XLS plus. XLS plus. Yeah. Yeah, yeah five years. Years. I've got about. And how, how, I mean, how many hours do you usually fly a year? 250, about, 300? About 225. 225. I've got okay. about, I'll have, uh, in five years, I'll have a little over about 1,100 hours on the airplane. Okay. On the airplane. Oh, okay. Yeah, we fly roughly two days a week. I don't want to fly much more. Once in a while, three days, but two or three, two, two days is enough here and there. An extra day. I don't want to fly more than that. So, do you always use the airplane, or do you use the airplane also to send your people out? And or I will use the airplane to take. I'm always 
on the airplane. The airplane never goes out without me on board. Okay. So it's, you're, you're I don't on. have, problem is I don't have, I can't find another part-time PIC or an SIC. It's very difficult to find somebody on a part-time basis that will be yeah. approved by an insurance. Insurance company is very, very demanding in yes. terms of yes. any, uh, any, anybody sitting in the cockpit, the, the requirements are, are very uh, demanding. Yeah, yeah. Now, tell us about your pilot training. Um, how do you go about your training? How often do you go? Do you do I, any I guess training? I've been going to flight safety. <laughs> you think I've learned something over the last 40 some years. <laughs> yeah. So once yeah. again, I'm going in October for the probably 44, 45th year. Yeah. Uh, as you know, uh, the schools concentrate on the airplane. You're flying. So I've yep. been at the flight safety now. This will be the sixth year flight safety for the SIC course. My yep. PIC goes with me. And yep. so both of us attend the same course. It's the SIC PIC is the same course for three days. And we'll be in Orlando, Florida this year in October to complete that course. Okay. Do you do any, any upset recovery training? Uh, no. We could. No, but, uh don't because the uh, my PIC uh, was a U.S. Air Force uh, jet jet fighter instructor, and he has done everything imaginable, full yeah. colonel. So he yeah. knows this sort of thing, and for me, it would be academic. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I get it. Okay. Uh, now, tell us what has flying taught you about business. I think the thing that flying has taught me about business, and it reinforces my uh, training as a lawyer, is that it teaches you to be aware and always to look for a way out. What am I going to do if? Both the lawyer, a practicing lawyer, and a pilot particularly, is always going to ask that question, what if? What do I do? And of course, that's what flight safety emphasizes what do i do if a generator goes down firing the engine oxygen gone what if and that applies to business build a development what if it doesn't work out and i plan for that what if interest rates go out of sight what if this what if that i think these are the questions that uh, flying and, and uh, the law kind of reinforces your uh, sense of uh, caution yeah. So, Dick, what advice would you give to a young person today that's watching this or, or, or reading the article? Don't do what don't don't do what I did. <laughs> Why? <laughs> I think that uh, I don't really have uh, any advice to give anybody because I just think that these things are inherent. You have it or you don't. I can't give it. It's like an artist. You can't teach an artist to paint. I can't yeah. teach an, I can't teach somebody how to be a businessman. You either have it or you don't. If you have it, you don't need to hear from me. If you don't have it, it's I can't communicate that. Yeah. I always yeah. say if you if you have it, follow your instincts. Careful, caution. Yeah. yeah. Be precise. Be relentless. Be responsible. Yeah. Do any of your family members fly? My, no, my son indicated an interest, but never followed it through. And that's fine for me because unless you're really into it, as you know, it's yeah. not a safe thing to do. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. It's not, it's not a hobby like playing tennis. No, it's not a hobby. Not a hobby. Yeah. That's why I always tell people, you know, whether you're going to, if you're going to fly a jet and you're going to fly it like you do for business and that, um, Obviously, you are interested in flying. That's why you fly. But it needs to be treated in a professional manner. You can't just... Absolutely. Be careful. There. Careful, yeah. careful, right? Yeah. yeah. How many hours flying do you have? Probably close to 9,000. Yeah. Okay. And did, what licenses did you get over the years? Did you get commercial license? I've got commercial, multi-family, jet, uh, instrument, all of them. Okay. All of them. Okay. Good. So you do your training twice a year. Um, and you keep the airplane there in Pittsburgh. You're the only one. I train flies. once a year. We train once a year. Once a year, okay. Yep. Yes. Flight safety. Okay. 
Okay. So what what do you think? Do you think you're going to keep this check for a while yet? Or you, do you think you're going to change? Well, it? Yes. I you know, <laughs> the insurance company doesn't like me because of my age. And I don't okay. know how they would feel. I would like to acquire a Praetor 500. Okay. But yeah. first of all, I don't want to wait two years for it. And it's yeah. competitive. The latitude is a year and a half. And that's not going to work. So I'll probably just keep the 560. If I saw an opening to get the Praetor, I don't know how the insurance company would react to it. Probably not very well. But So I'm okay. pretty much confined to where I am. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I mean, the airplane does its job. It hasn't got many the hours on it. It does, but the Praetor is much faster, further, bigger, so forth and so on. Yeah, that's true. Yeah, you could go further. If it, yeah, you could extend your range a little bit. Yeah. yeah. Praetor is a real continental airplane. Yeah, and it's very modern as well. It's got that side step yeah. fly-by-wire. Um, the avionics are easy to use as well. Uh, so yeah. It's easy to get your head around how, how that works. Um, yeah. And the systems are easy as well. So I, mean, I think Embraer have done a very good job. Uh, with their airplanes, like Cessna has as well. I mean, Cessna is very reliable. Uh, but the Praetor, the, the Praetor outcompetes the latitude 10 to 1. It's faster, further, bigger, and probably a little less money. Yeah, yeah. Okay, interesting, interesting. Okay, so what where, what developments do you see happening in the business world in the next few years? I mean, I know in America you've got this U.S. election coming up shortly. Um, how do you I think don't that's think, really about business? I don't think the election has much to do with anything in terms of business. Okay. Uh, business is by and large uh, a function of the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve is, so to speak, non-political. And yep. to some extent, I think uh, the Federal Reserve stays on course. I think things will be very good. They seem to be sensitive to the concern about Perhaps uh, uh, things slowing down a little bit. They know when to put the foot on the accelerator and when to put the foot on the, the uh, brake. So I think, by and large, from what I can see, next few years look pretty good. But, yeah. again, yeah. there's so many variables that it, one never really knows. Yeah, well, a lot of entrepreneurs say that. They say, I don't care who's in office, we'll find a way to do what yeah. we need to do. and We'll, find well I think that's... That, that is exactly right. The good entrepreneurs, they're going to survive no matter what. Yeah, exactly. So you see a, a growing need then for single-family homes, uh, multi-family homes. I, and there's like a that. tremendous need for housing in the, the developed world. There isn't yeah. enough housing anywhere. Anywhere. Yeah. Yeah, same here in England. Uh, both, yeah, we, both, uh, both rental and uh, home ownership. Very much undersupplied. So, so Dick, when you build an apartment block, do you keep all the apartments or do you sell yes. them afterwards? You, we'll keep you, them, you we all, them we've always kept them. We may, we may sell one or two complexes this year for the first time, but by and large, they're built to keep. Mm. Okay. That's an interesting strategy. And, and are all of them pretty much the same or do you change? We use about three or four different styles, but they're basically compatible. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Okay, great. Uh, Dick, thank you very much for, for being here on BizJet TV and sharing your story. Um, it's great to hear. Um, ah, tell me a bit about, yeah, before we go, your family and that. Do you take your family with you on many uh, jet trips? Uh, no, my family, the only time my family is on board typically is my wife and I fly to our home in Palm Beach uh, yeah. for the winter. But that's yeah. the only time my family is on board. Uh, I might take my son and his family or my daughter and her family, but they would be going to Palm Beach. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, so, so mainly the family travels on the Palm Beach flights then? That's right. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And then and the you, Palm Beach, you, you keep the jet down there with you? I do. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, because as you said, the, the plane goes where you go. So uh, yeah, The only yeah. problem that that creates is if Trump gets back into office, we cannot land the airplane in Palm Beach if he's in his home at Mar-a-Lago. We have to put it down somewhere else. Okay, because of security around yeah, the area. Yeah, exactly. exactly. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, if, he, if he gets in, he'll probably be spending a lot of time in the White House, I should imagine. Well, hopefully he stays out of Palm Beach. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you can park your jet. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Okay, yeah. Dick, thank you very much for being on BizJet TV. 
And uh, thank you everybody for watching. Remember to subscribe to the channel and we'll see you on the next one. Thank you.